All right, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Happy Monday. So I hope everybody had a pretty good weekend. We didn't do anything uh, super exciting, although we did have a couple of the kids' friends come by yesterday, uh, sort of sitting around, uh, you know, in one of these in these camping chairs, right, like six to eight feet apart, right? And the kids were kind of running around playing hide and seek, so that was pretty fun. Hope you got a chance to do something exciting. Um, I was back on campus today too, so um, you know things are looking okay, although there's not not too many people whenever I go back, so I'm trying to go once or twice a week. I hope everybody's doing okay out there. Just uh, going over the announcements that I made last week. So first, if you didn't get a chance over the weekend, please watch the YouTube video that I put up that talks about finding specific entropy. Some of this will be familiar to you because some of it is, um, you know, using tables, to find S in the same way that we would for superheated vapors if we were looking for enthalpy, but it'll be different if we're looking for specific entropy in some cases, right? So we'll talk about how do you find delta S across, say, in a pump where it's not ideal. We have liquid on both sides of the pump. We also talk about how do you find delta S in a process with an ideal gas. So some of those things are different. So please go watch that video. The first half, I think it's about it's about 30 minutes long. The first half is talking about strategies for finding S and delta S. And then the second half is an example with an ideal gas, I believe. The second um, note that I want to make is that RIT is observing Friday or July 4th on Friday, even though that's July 3rd. So we will move our class to Thursday, July 2nd from 4 to 5, instead of Friday, July 3rd from 4 to 5 this week. We're still going to have our class on Canada Day, which is Wednesday. So usually I would be able to go up and uh, sort of spend some time with my family this time of year because all my family lives north of the border. But uh, the border is closed, so we will have to content ourselves with Zoom meetings. Um, we'll also be, I, th I think I mentioned this last class, but we're going to get into cycles very shortly. So sort of by the end of this week, beginning of next week, we'll get more deeply into Rankin cycles. And then that sort of starts our journey into all kinds of different cycles. So we're just about finished um, trying to figure out how to process individual processes. And we'll get into cycle analysis very shortly. So one of the things I did last year during the shutdown was even though I wasn't teaching this class, I made a bunch of videos doing examples for each type of cycle. So I've made those videos available on the My Courses webpage. So you're obviously, as we go through different cycles, you're certainly welcome to, uh, to check those out. So today we're going to talk about isentropic efficiency. But before we do that, I think it's good to sort of have a bit of a high level review of, of some of the things we've talked about in terms of entropy and isentropic processes. So we know that entropy is kind of some level of randomness or disorder in a system that um, it's not conserved. So it's different than mass and energy, which are the other sort of two big concepts that we're talking about in this class. We know it has particular units. Um, so if we're talking about entropy, the extensive process, the extensive property, that would be kilojoules per kilogram, and the intensive version is in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Another thing that we know is that sometimes it's useful to talk about an ideal or a reversible process, but even though this is sometimes a useful construct or a useful way to kind of understand where the limit of a process can be, we have to understand that these uh, reversible or ideal processes, they don't really exist, right? So it's impossible to actually have a reversible process, but it kind of gives us the limit of performance. And it also sometimes gives us the structure of what an analytical expression for an ideal process looks like. And that might help us look at which variables we can tweak to improve the performance of whatever real system we have. So if we're looking at turbines and pumps, right? So this is pretty, you know, these are pretty important processes, particularly when we're talking about 
heat engines where the purpose of all of these heat engines is to produce work or power, right, which is the rate of work that we're producing. So if we're looking at real turbines and pumps, some assumptions that we can make typically in this class will be that we're operating these components at steady state, that we're operating them adiabatically so that there's no heat loss. Remember in the first law, the purpose of these processes is to either produce or consume power. So often we won't have to worry about heat loss, but remember these are um, common assumptions, which is different than assumptions that you'll absolutely make every time. After we make these two assumptions, we'll get this equation, that this entropy generation rate, which we know has to be positive, is equal to the sum of m dot out s out minus the sum of m dot in s in. So for a reversible turbine and pump, right, those are, those are processes where there are no irreversibilities, right? If it's reversible, there's nothing that's making it irreversible right, or that its entropy generation rate is zero. So if this term, sigma dot, goes to zero and we're at steady state with one inlet, one outlet, then these summation signs go, go away and there's only one mass flow rate. So we get zero is equal to m dot times delta s. And in the, you know, this, that equation is only interesting if m dot is something that's not zero. So if m dot's not zero in that case, it means that delta s would have to be zero. So if we have a turbine or a pump that's at steady state, it's adiabatic, and there's one inlet and one outlet, then the ideal version of that turbine or pump is going to be isentropic, which means that the change in specific entropy will be zero. Of course, in a real turbine or a real pump, even if it's one inlet, one outlet, we never are going to get rid of that sigma dot term. So there we will have that S2, the specific entropy at the exit of the turbine or the pump, has to be bigger than the specific entropy at the inlet because that's the way we generate entropy in those cases, even if they're adiabatic. So that's why we kind of got to this idea of drawing these things out on TS diagrams. TS diagrams are useful to us because when we have the real turbine, we know that the exit of the real turbine has the, or the exit of the ideal turbine, I'm sorry, is isentropic. So that means that S of that outlet for the ideal turbine is S2S. Remember, that's kind of a hint to us that it's isentropic. And that's a vertical line down as we're moving out of our turbine. We know that in real life, that that exit of the turbine has bigger specific entropy than the ideal outlet. So then as we go through this turbine, we have to go down because we're still reducing the pressure, but we move to the right because we're increasing the entropy. Same is true for the pump, although in the pump we're moving up in pressure, but the ideal outlet from the pump has the same specific entropy as the inlet. So it's a vertical line, but this time up. The real outlet of that pump, again, S4 has to be bigger than S3, so this line, if we're drawing it on a TS diagram, will slope up and to the right. Now, it's probably exaggerated here how far each of these lines maybe shift to the right, but this is just kind of conceptually, we want to see that the specific entropy is increasing in the real case, but remains constant in the ideal case. So let's look here at the ideal turbine for a second. So what will often happen? Right? We're almost always, when we're dealing with a turbine, we'll be given enough information to, fi to fix the inlet state. Now this will often, although not always, be a superheated vapor. So maybe we get the temperature and the pressure at the inlet. And then if we want the ideal outlet of that turbine, we might only get a pressure or a temperature at the outlet, but if it's ideal, then that means for turbines and pumps that it's also isentropic. So we get that second independent intensive property by assuming that the isentropic outlet is the same as S at the inlet, right? So S2S is equal to S1. So then it's this vertical line down. Then, you know, so typically, like I said, at the exit of the turbine, you'll usually be given either a temperature or a pressure and along with 
your specific entropy, because you're assuming this is isotropic, you'll be able to fix that state. So in this case, what we would do is we would look, okay, I know, so I'm just drawing this as a sketch. So I don't know if I'm putting this point in the right place. I know it's in the right region, so it's superheated vapor. And then when I move down, I would know that, okay, it's possible that I've drawn this correctly and I'm under the vapor dome now, but it's possible that state one was maybe supposed to be over here. And as I draw it down, I would still be in superheated vapor. So what I have to do is look at S2S for the given temperature or pressure that I know and see if it's between SF and SG. So am I going to be a two-phase mixture when I come out of my turbine, or am I going to be a superheated vapor? If I'm dealing with an ideal pump, it's pretty similar, but for ideal pumps, we have this special way of finding the change in specific enthalpy. Now, I believe that there was, you know, that this was potentially a quiz question or in the homework for last week, so I guess this week, because it's due today, right? Um, so delta H, this is a little bit different, right? So it's a subcooled liquid at the inlet and a subcooled liquid at the outlet. But we can't, you know, normally we would say if you're trying to find the specific enthalpy at the subcool, at, in the subcooled liquid region, you can approximate that by saying it's HF at the same temperature. But one of the things we also see for these ideal pumps is that the temperature doesn't change between the inlet and the outlet. So we can't assume that both of these specific enthalpies are the same. Because then what we would do is we would be predicting that this ideal pump, you don't even have to plug it into the wall, it just works without consuming any power. And we know that that's not possible even for an ideal pump. So instead, we remember that H is equal to the specific internal energy plus PV. So for delta H, we assume that delta U is zero, and then we're left with this delta H is equal to the specific volume, which we're going to assume is constant, is about the same at state 3 and state 4S, times the change in pressure. So it's only this change in pressure that's really driving how much power we're consuming in this ideal pump. How do we find delta S for an ideal pump? So if you did, have a chance to watch that uh, that video about how to find S and delta S, you would see that for cases where we have a subcooled liquid on both sides of a process, we would see that delta S is equal to the specific heat times the natural log of T2 divided by T1 if we have S2 minus S1. Right? This is almost, you know, if you squint a little bit here, this looks a little bit like Cp times delta T, which is how you would find delta H if you were talking about subcooled liquid to subcooled liquid. So I know it's different because now it's the natural log of T2 over T1, but I kind of file those in a similar place in my memory banks, right? Although, again, this equation should be on the equation sheet. But what you'll see is that if T2 is equal to T1, right? So T2S is equal to T1 in this case, so you're going to get the natural log of 1, which is 0. So it doesn't matter what your Cp is, your delta S here will be 0, right? And that's because for this ideal pump, we have an isentropic process. Delta S is equal to 0, right? So we see that that's how we find delta S across the pump. So hopefully, we have a couple strategies for finding what the ideal exit to a turbine and a pump looks like. But today, we're going to talk about how we use isentropic efficiency to find the real outlet for turbines and pumps. Right? So we know if we draw the TS diagram, the ideal pump is this vertical line up from state 3 to 4S. And the ideal turbine is this vertical line down from state 1 to state 2S. We also know that the real outlet of the turbine moves down and to the right because the specific entropy at state 2 has to be bigger than the specific entropy at state 2s. Similarly, for the real pump, we know that S4 has to be bigger than S4s. So again, we're moving to the right, but this time we're going up and to the right instead of down and to the right. So the real state is always to the right of the ideal state when we're talking about turbines and pumps. 
So how do we figure this out, right? And one way that we can think about how to find the real, uh, the real outlet is by looking at something called isentropic efficiency. Now, I've said before that, you know, if you're ever, if I'm ever, you know, sitting on your senior design process or project or something, and you talk about you make a decision because it's more efficient, my hand's going to go up right away and I'm going to say, like, what do you mean by efficiency? Because in this class, in thermodynamics, there's multiple different types of efficiencies that we're talking about. And they don't always just mean goodness, right? Which I think is kind of colloquially what efficiency is, you know, is taken to mean. So isentropic efficiency, right? So here we're going to talk about the performance of a turbine or a pump compared to its pro to its performance if it was an isentropic process. So we'll be comparing the the work produced by a turbine to the work that gets produced in an ideal case, or the power consumed by a pump compared to the power that gets consumed in an ideal case. Right? So we know that if we use the word isentropic, right, we bust out our engineering decoder ring, and what it tells us is that isentropic means that entropy of the system does not increase, right? And it doesn't decrease either. It in fact stays the same. Right? So this is in the case of turbines and pumps, when we're assuming that they're at steady state, that there's one inlet and one outlet, and that they're adiabatic. If we have a process that's isentropic, that means it's also ideal. We usually wouldn't use the word isentropic if we weren't talking about a process that fits into these assumptions, right? So usually when we're using the word isentropic, we're talking about turbines and pumps and we're assuming that they're ideal. So even though sometimes you might be tempted to think of these two words as being interchangeable, they do mean something a little bit different, even though you'd probably only be talking about an isentropic process if you were also talking about an ideal process. So isentropic efficiency, right? So again, our, our symbol for efficiency in this class is going to be this scripted M or eta in the Greek alphabet. So we have isentropic efficiency for a turbine or isentropic efficiency for a pump. And conceptually, these two things are essentially the same. But you'll see when we're defining these parameters, the mathematical definition is a little bit different if you're talking about a turbine or a pump. So both of these things, what they're doing is they're providing a way to compare the real performance to the ideal performance. What we know about efficiencies is that this is not, you know, you're not interviewing Tom Brady after a game or something, right? You can max out at 100% efficiency. And actually, in real life, you can't even get to 100% efficiency because that implies that your real process is the same as your ideal process, and we can't do that, right? So efficiency, isentropic efficiency, always has to be less than 100%. If you're ever calculating something to have an isentropic efficiency of equal to 100%, that means you're talking about the isentropic or ideal process. And if you have an isentropic efficiency greater than 100%, then that means that you violated the second law. We can't do that. You can never perform better than the ideal case. So in order to define performance, it makes sense to look at the first law. Right? So when we're talking about performance of a turbine, what's the performance that matters? Right? Now, when we analyze a turbine with the first law, we'll say typically that it's at steady state, that there's no change in elevation, no change in kinetic energy. It's well insulated right? or adiabatic, so that that heat transfer term is essentially zero or at least much smaller than the power produced. If it's one inlet and one outlet, we'll get this equation that hopefully we're starting to feel pretty comfortable with that this first law for the turbine is that the power generated by that turbine is equal to the mass flow rate times h in minus h out right so the whole purpose the performance of the turbine is defined by the amount of power that it produces right so for the ideal turbine our inlet state is h1 and our outlet state is h2s that's the enthalpy in the case 
where the change in entropy or specific entropy is zero. For the real case, we go between state one and state two, right? Not state two S. So this is the outlet of the turbine where the specific entropy at the outlet is greater than the specific entropy at the inlet, right? Now, remember, when we're talking about an ideal and real turbine, everything else stays the same. So they have the same mass flow rate, right? They have the same pressure difference. It's just that one of these things has an isentropic outlet and the other thing has a real outlet. So now I want to characterize my efficiency, which means I got to take one of these powers and divide by the other one. But in order to do that, I got to ask myself which one's bigger because I want to have W dot divided by W dot and I want my thermal efficiency to be less than 100%. So I'll give you a second here and you can think about, so this is a turbine, right? The purpose of the turbine is to produce power. So which turbine is going to produce more power? Is the ideal turbine going to produce more power or is the real turbine going to produce more power? I'll give you a second to think about it. Here, let's try this. So if you're um, if you're looking at your screen, right, why don't you put your hand up if you think that the ideal turbine is going to produce more power than the real turbine? Let's see. See if we can get some interactive part of the lecture here. Okay, I got one hand up, two hands up, three hands up. Okay, so now if you can put your hands down, awesome. Who thinks that the real turbine is going to produce more power than the ideal turbine? Okay, I don't see any hands up. Now, um, who just uh, doesn't want to think about it too much because it's Monday? <laughs> That's good. We got at least one honest hand. In the crowd here right i can understand that right so um the ideal turbine right so the purpose of the turbine is to produce power right so the ideal turbine is going to produce more power than the real turbine the way that i like to think about this is you know this ideal turbine is frictionless right but the real turbine has some friction and that friction is going to rob us of some of the power that we would generate in the ideal case. So we're going to lose a little bit of power in the real turbine because we have to overcome these irreversibilities, right? So now we're going to define our our specific our, our sorry. Now we're going to define our isentropic efficiency, but we know that the ideal turbine is going to be bigger or produce more power than the real turbine, right? So both of these isentropic efficiencies are going to be power divided by power. And we know that for both of these isentropic efficiencies, one for a turbine, one for a pump, they have to be less than 100%. Now, we've already said that the ideal turbine is going to produce more power than the real turbine. So that means that I have to put the ideal turbine on the bottom. So now my turbine efficiency is going to be the real power for the power produced by the real turbine divided by the power produced by the ideal turbine. And again, this is kind of because the university is it, sorry, because the universe is working against us, right? So it's like, um, you know, this friction, it's, it's taking away from the thing that we want. And the thing that we want here is to produce more power. So the universe kind of acts against that a little bit in terms of friction and things, right? So this is the second law at work. So we can't produce as much power as the ideal turbine, right? So now we can think about this um, from the point of view of the pump, right? So again, we're going to make all these same, same assumptions. So it's going to be steady state, no change in potential energy, no change in kinetic energy, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet. And we get that the power consumed by the pump is going to be M dot times H in minus H out. This is the same as it is for the turbine, except that in this case, the pump is consuming power. We have to put power in for the pump to work. 
back. So we'd expect this number to be negative, right? Again, with the ideal pump, we're going to be m dot times h1, or the inlet, minus h2s, which is the isentropic outlet. And the same thing is true for the real pump, but now it's going to be m dot times h1 minus h2, where h2 is the real outlet of the pump. Now, we ask ourselves again, which one's bigger? So, the pump is consuming power, right? Which means that, you know, when I plug it into the wall, I got to pay RG&E or who's ever, you know, running my electricity bill. I got to pay them some money because the pump is consuming power. So, it costs less money to run this ideal pump and more money to run the real pump. So what that means is that the real pump consumes more power than the ideal pump. And that's because, again, of these irreversibilities, right? This friction, it's always robbing us of the thing that we want. So here, we want to consume as little power as possible. But when we're adding power to the system, it turns out we got to add a little more power in because we have to overcome things like friction inside of our pump. So our isentropic pump efficiency is, again, it's going to be power divided by power. One of these things is real. One of these things is ideal. And we know we need the bigger number on the bottom because our isentropic efficiency has to be less than 100%. Right? So here, we know that the real pump is going to consume more than the ideal pump because this power is like an energy cost and not an energy benefit and the universe in some ways is always working against us so here the pumps require power right so the losses in the system we got to overcome those losses in the system and the way we do that is we got to put in a little bit more power so when we're talking about isentropic efficiency of a pump then what we see is that we need to put the real power on the bottom Right? These are both going to be negative numbers, so a negative divided by a negative is still going to be a positive, and our pump efficiency is going to be less than 100%. Right? So this is, it actually becomes pretty important to be able to use these isentropic efficiencies. So there's two ways, really, that problems will force you to deal with isentropic efficiency. So in one case, a problem might tell you the isentropic efficiency, and let's say it's a turbine, give you enough information to fix the first state, the inlet state. So then you find the real state, or you find the ideal state that's the outlet of the turbine, and you use the isentropic efficiency to then find the real outlet. Or in that same turbine, it could tell you enough information to fix the inlet and the real outlet, and then you find the ideal outlet so that you can find the efficiency. Right? And I know it's hard if I just you know, tell you those things. So we'll go through a couple of, of examples at the end of this lecture to, um, to help you figure out how to do this. Right? So the whole point of this talk so far has been how do we get to find these real outlet states? Right? So typically, like I said, what can happen here is if we're not given enough information state-wise, right? So to fix this state, normally, we'd say we need two independent intensive properties. But if we're told something about the process, like what its isentropic efficiency is, then if they told me the inlet, if I got enough information to fix state one, and they told me either the temperature or the pressure at state two, if I also knew the isentropic efficiency, then I could find what the real or what the ideal turbine power was, and then use the isentropic efficiency equation to find the real turbine power. Right, so I know that in reality, the entropy is going to increase as I go through a real turbine or a real pump. So, uh, like I said, so these inefficiencies, they're always kind of working against us. So we're trying to produce power for the turbine, so it's an energy benefit. And what these inefficiencies do is they strip us of some of the power we would otherwise otherwise generate in this turbine. And for the pump, the power is a cost to the system because we've got to plug the thing into the wall to run it, right? So it's going to increase the cost that we pay. 
So these inefficiencies, they reduce benefits and they increase costs. So like I said, it's a little tricky if I just say in words the things you can do. So I'm going to try to show you in two different examples. So in the first example, we have this turbine. So here, I look at my state table, and I have a real inlet, state 1. I have an ideal outlet, state 2S, where I'm only told the temperature. And I have this real outlet where I'm told the temperature and that the quality is 1. So right away, I look at this and I say, I can fix two of these states. This is what I really like about drawing a, TF, or a state table. One of the reasons I like drawing a state table is that I can look at the lines in the state table and see where do I know two pieces of information, right? And hopefully, where I know two pieces of information, I can fix the state. That's definitely going to be true because I can always fix the state with the temperature and the quality. The pressure and the temperature, maybe this doesn't work if I'm under the vapor dome, but here I'm thinking that usually when I go into a turbine, I want to be a superheated vapor or at least a saturated vapor. So I'm hoping that with the temperature and the pressure here, I can fix that state. So here I'm asked to find the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. So how do I go about doing that? So how do I fix a non-ideal state, right? So first I want to fix the ideal state, and then I want to fix the non-ideal state. Although in this case, I'm given all the information to fix that non-ideal state without even using isentropic efficiencies because I'm trying to find the isentropic efficiency, right? So here I'm given enough information to find the first state, the inlet state. I give, I have the temperature and the pressure. I look on, I think it's table A4, and I see that we're superheated vapor here. So I look in my table and I see that the specific enthalpy here is 3,697.9. I can write down the specific entropy here as well. And quality doesn't really make sense to write down here because this is a superheated vapor. So now what I want to do is say, how do I find the outlet of this ideal turbine, the isentropic outlet, right? And again, the hint here is that this is state 2S. And when we put that S in the state number, it means that it's isentropic, right? So it looks like I only know one piece of information here, that we have the temperature, but really, I also know that this is an isentropic process. So I don't find H2S right away. Instead, I realize that the entropy here, the specific entropy, is the same as it was at the turbine inlet. Now, I gotta figure out, because this is water, so I know the material is water. The next thing I have to do is say, what's the phase, right? It's coming out of a turbine, so I'm not expecting this to be um, a subcooled liquid, but it could be a two-phase mixture, and it could be a superheated vapor. So what I would do is I would look on, I think it's table A2, where the temperature is given on the left. I'd look for the row that told me that the temperature was 45 degrees, and I look to see what's SF and what's SG. And is this value of specific entropy in between SF and SG, or is it bigger than SG? So in this case, we're in between SF and SG. So we're going to use our quality equation to figure out what the quality is in this case. So we know S of 2S, that's going to be the same as S1. We know SF because we read this off the table. We don't know X2S, but we do know SFG, where SFG is going to be SG minus SF on that row of the table. So in this case, the quality is really high, but it's not quite 1. So here I know the quality. Now I'm going to use the quality equation again, but in this case, I don't know H of 2S. I do know HF. I do know X of 2S. And I know HFG, because I can read that off the table. Right, so I use this quality equation twice, 
once for the specific entropy to find x2s, and then once I know x2s, I use that to find h2s. And in this case, it's 2540, right? Now in this case, you may, if you're thinking about what the TS diagram looks like, you may have known that this was going to be a two-phase mixture because if I went down and to the right and got to a saturated vapor, then that means if I went straight down, I must have been right under the vapor band. But you didn't need to have that insight beforehand because you can just look at this number and see is it between SF and SG. So now we're almost done. If I look at the real outlet of my turbine, I see that I have a temperature and I have a quality. So now, because I have quality and quality is one, I don't have to do any interpolation here. I just know that H is going to be HG and S is going to be SG. So I would look this up in a table. S2 is SG. And that's a little bit higher, right? This I'm getting confidence here, right? Because I know that the isentropic process should have S remain the same and the real process should have S increase. So that's good. That looks good, right? H2 is going to be HG. And this is a little bit higher. Now, does this make sense? So remember that the power developed by the turbine is going to be M naught times H in minus H out. So here, because H of 2 is a little bit bigger than H of 2S, the difference between H1 and H2 is going to be a little bit smaller than the difference between H1 and H2S, right? Which makes sense because the real turbine should produce less power than the ideal turbine. So let's see what happens. Now the problem asks us to find the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. So I look at my equation sheet, or maybe I just think about this and I, and I see that the real turbine has to produce less power than the ideal turbine. The real turbine, if I can make the assumptions that I usually, but don't always make for turbines, is gonna be m dot times h in minus h out. It's the same inlet in both cases, h1, but the outlet for the real turbine is h2, and the outlet for the ideal turbine is h2s. These turbines have the same mass flow rate, right? So the M dot's gonna cancel out, but apparently that's not how I animated the slide, right? So here we know H1, we know H2, we know H1, and we know H2S. We don't know the mass flow rate through the real turbine, and we don't know the mass flow rate through the ideal turbine. The good news is it doesn't matter, right? So this turbine efficiency can be the power over the power but it could also be the specific power, which is just delta H on the real turbine, divided by the specific power of the ideal turbine, which is just delta H for the ideal turbine, right? Because it doesn't actually matter to me what these mass flow rates are because I factor them out of the numerator and the denominator, so I can just cancel them out. I know the rest of these numbers, and I see that my turbine efficiency is 96.2%. So it's not perfect. Right? It's not 100%, but 96% is pretty good. <coughs> but it's, um, it's still a big deal, even if you can squeeze less than a percent in efficiency increase out of a turbine. So this is, I went to a conference once and they were talking about, this was kind of right as um, 3D printed things were coming online. And they had, I think the speaker was from GE, and they were saying that, you know, this was great because they could get some turbine blade profiles that they would not have been able to machine, uh, you know, traditionally. But this 3D printing would allow them to get some blade profiles that they otherwise wouldn't be able to make. And they were expecting that to be able to increase the efficiency, right? So even if we just increase the efficiency a little bit of, say, a turbine that's in a nuclear power plant that's constantly running, just getting small increases in efficiency can lead to large increases in uh, the amount of power generated, right? Which ultimately gives us a better thermal efficiency. So even though maybe this is already at 96%, if we could get to 96.5% or 97%, um, 
you'd be certainly helping the earth, but probably helping your own pocketbook too, because this is part of the reason why people hire engineers is how do we make the process even a little bit better can really change how the process works, right? So it reduces emissions per power generated, but it's also going to increase revenue, right? So that's one way that we can do an isotropic efficiency problem where we're given enough information to fix the states and the problem tells us the isotropic, or the, and we try to solve for the isentropic efficiency. The other way we can do these isentropic efficiency problems is like this one, <coughs> where the problem gives us the isentropic efficiency. So this time it's a pump, right? And I look at my state table, and maybe I feel not so good in this case, because I only have one state, the inlet, where I have enough information to fix the state. I don't have enough information to fix the state of the ideal outlet or the real outlet. <coughs> so how do I proceed in a case like this? The first thing is, maybe I just look up the state that I know how to look up because while I'm doing that, I can think about what to do next in the problem, right? So here I would look again, I think it's table A2, but it could be A3. I confuse these two sometimes. Um, the one where the temperatures are round numbers, and I'm going to find HF and SF because this is a saturated liquid. So here I can just add these things into my state table. I can also see that if I have water that's boiling at 45 degrees, the pressure is just about 0.1 bar, right? So one tenth of an atmosphere, basically. So what do I do next? Right? I think. If you were in this case, the best thing to do is to next try to find the ideal outlet. Because we do have another piece of information about the ideal outlet. It's, it's sort of buried in the wording here, right? Because this S4S is an isentropic outlet, which means that S4S must be equal to S3. Right? So that's good. I know the S here. Right? But I also know that the process moving from state 3 to state 4S is an ideal pump. Right? So if we're going through an ideal pump, we can find the change in the specific enthalpy as the specific volume times the change in pressure. Okay, so now I know here the change in the pressure, right? Because I looked up the pressure, I know the pressure where water boils. I don't know the specific volume. I'm going to assume that the specific volume is approximately equal in these two cases. If you'd prefer, you could have this, if your delta H was H3 minus H4S, you could say V3 times P3 minus V4S times P4S. But the specific volumes for water, that subcooled liquid, are always going to be about the same which is always about one over a thousand. So here I'm going to assume that these specific volumes are the same. And I'm going to take VF of this state. I probably should have put specific volume on my state table here, right? So I could have put specific volume over here and seen that this was about one over a thousand. I did look it up here. So here I took VF at state three, and I found that this is about one over a thousand meters cubed per kilogram. And I multiply this by the pressure difference. Now, you'll notice here, if I think, so first, when we're dealing with ideal pumps, there's two things that are tricky. The first is just remembering that you can use this equation. The second is getting the units right. So I didn't do it here, but if I was drawing my own state table on a exam problem, for example, I like to put my pressure in kilopascals because if I take specific volume times kilopascals, what I'm going to get is kilojoules per kilogram. And that's what I want H to be. Because when I look H up in the table, it's in kilojoules per kilogram. So I've changed in my calculation. I turned this. Remember, to go from bar to kilopascals, you have to multiply by 100. So 100 times 10 is 1,000. 0.096 times 100 is 9.6. Right, so that's my pressure difference. 
right? And I get that H4S minus H3 is equal to approximately one kilojoule per kilogram, right? Because this is about one over a thousand. This is about a thousand. So a thousand divided by a thousand is about one. My units here, this is kilopascals, right? So that's kilonewtons per meter, kilonewtons per meter squared, right? So meters cubed divided by meters squared, that'd be kilonewton meters on the top, which is kilojoules, right? So here I get that S4S is one kilojoule per kilogram bigger than S3, right? So now I can put this in, right? So S4S is 189.45, which is one larger than 188.45. So now, how do I find the real outlet for the turbine? So this, or the, for the pump. So this is something that we'll often have to do, but now it's okay because I know the isentropic efficiency. So sometimes when we fix a state, we'll know two independent intensive properties at both sides of our process. Sometimes we'll only know it on one side of our process, but the problem will tell us something about the process. Like in this case, they tell us that the isentropic efficiency is 0.9 or 90%. So now I know that the real pump consumes more power than the ideal pump. So I use the definition of isentropic efficiency, right? M dot times H3 minus H4S, that's the ideal pump power, divided by M dot times H3 minus H4, that's the real pump power, I know that's going to be equal to 0.9. Because it only really makes sense to compare an ideal and a real process if the same mass flow rate is going through them, right? We can cancel that out. I've found H3 and H4S, and I know H3. So the only thing that I don't, and the problem told me the isentropic efficiency, so the only thing I don't know here is H4. So what I would do is I would flip this around. So I would multiply both sides by H3 minus H4 and divide both sides by the isentropic efficiency of the pump. And what I get here is H3 minus H4 is equal to H3 minus H4S divided by the isentropic efficiency. In this case, I know that H3 minus H4S, so it's, here I have a check mark beside both of these things, right? Because I know both of these things, but I also just know the delta, right? So, and I know the isentropic efficiency. So this is negative one, right? Because now it's H3 minus H4S, right? So 188.45 minus 189.45 is negative one, divided by 0.9, right? So this is gonna be negative 1.11 kilojoules per kilogram. And that tells me that H4, is 1.11 kilojoules per kilogram bigger than H3, right? So here I can take H3, add 1.11 instead of just one. And here I see that the delta H across this real pump is bigger than the delta H across the ideal pump. And that kind of, you know, is in tune with my intuition that the ideal pump doesn't have to worry about friction, so it consumes less power. Right? Delta H is smaller for the ideal pump and larger for the real pump. So that concludes our introduction to this idea of isentropic efficiency. So in both cases, it's going to be power divided by power. We have to figure out which one is bigger, and that's the one that goes in the denominator. And then we can either fix both sides of the real process and find the isentropic efficiency, or we can fix one side of the real process and use the isentropic efficiency to find the other side of the real process. So does anybody have any questions about the material we covered today? Excellent. I will see you all again on Wednesday. I hope everybody has a good couple of days, I guess, till we see Wednesday. And uh, remember that your homework is due tonight. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.